Good afternoon, everyone. Please. I'm Joanne Van Schaik. I'm the interim director of Calder Memorial Library, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the library and to the 13th biennial Gross Lecture. The lecture was established in 1990 by Calder Library to commemorate the Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross Memorial Library Endowment. It was created to honor Mr. Gross, the man whose legendary thirst for knowledge made him a regular visitor here at Calder Library. The lecture has been delivered every two years since 1991 by individuals of exceptional accomplishment who spoke on topics of their choice. The first lecturer was Dr. Emmanuel M. Papper, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean of the Miller School from 1969 to 1981. Successive lectures have been presented by UM President Emeritus Dr. Henry King Stanford, former Miller School Deans Dr. Bernard J. Fogel and Dr. John G. Clarkson, and former UM President Dr. Donna E. Shalala. Our current Miller School Dean is also among our distinguished speakers, and I am honored to introduce him today. Dean Pascal J. Goldschmidt is an accomplished leader and internationally renowned cardiologist whose research applies genomics and cell therapy to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of coronary artery disease. Before joining the Miller School of Medicine, Dean Goldschmidt served as chairman of the Department of Medicine at Duke University and director of cardiology at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health where he built the Heart and Lung Research Institute and a heart hospital. He is currently the Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean at the Leonard M. Miller <coughs> School of Medicine and serves as the Chief Executive Officer of U Health, the University of Miami's health system. Please extend a warm welcome to Dean Pascal J. Goldschmidt, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Joanne. It's great to be here. Uh, welcome to um, this uh, wonderful uh, Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross Endowed Lecture and Reception. Um, it's a very special event, and um, I'm delighted that uh, you all could uh, join us for, for uh, this uh, special event. Um, you know, I, I want to um, make sure that uh, we also uh, recognize together uh, the um, two very special guests, and these are the uh, Gross daughters, Patricia Bergman and Carol Gross Claxon. Um, we're so pleased that you could be here, and um, uh, as every year, uh, it has been wonderful to, to welcome you to the Mayor's School of Medicine. Um, and I believe that um, uh, we have uh, a chair of uh, department with us, uh, Dr. Robert Schwartz, who is chair of um, Family Medicine and Community Health. Bob, are you here? Oh, you're coming. Okay. Um, so, you know, it is such a, an honor to be introducing this lecture. Uh, I'm so appreciative to Ruth and um, to, to Ruth Gross's generous endowment in honor of her late husband, uh, Ralph, to support the Calder Library and this lecture series. Can you hear us well in the back? Okay. For those who are not familiar with the uh, wonderful Gross family, uh, I would love to share some of their uh, re remarkable uh, background. So the family came after World War II. Um, and you know, as many of us, they did whatever they could. So they bought a poultry farm in Fort Lauderdale. Um, now that didn't go so well. The uh, project has had an unfortunate and inauspicious start. Of the first 100 chicks that were born, 92 died, in spite of um, attempts to resuscitation, but uh, didn't work. So to improve their survival rate, Mr. Gross spent countless hours in our medical library, in our Calder Medi Medical Library, and um, tried to learn everything he could about 
how to make chicks survive. And he learned a lot about um, uh, science and he developed a special feed that helps chicks build immunity against infectious disease. And to this day, Ralph's thirst for knowledge continues to inspire us all. Um, through this lecture series, we have the opportunity to share the scholarship, scholarly pursuit of medical knowledge. Isn't it wonderful that the lecture that you will hear today came directly from the gratitude of Mr. Gross for the fact that he was able to learn what he needed to do to actually succeed. And um, in that context, it's also my great honor to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Lawrence B. Gardner, known to many of you as Lanny. Lanny is the Miller Professor of Medicine Executive Dean of, for Education and Policy at the Middle School. He attended college at MIT and he graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Medical School. He spent his medical residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, of course, and trained then in nephrology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And he also served as chief medical resident at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, he joined UM in 1974, and he has served a number of prestigious positions, and in particular, uh, he was the chairman of um, medicine with a formidable tenure before he became the executive dean for education and policy. And I, I would like to share, as the dean of the middle school, the um, really extraordinary accomplishments of uh, Lani. Too many to mention, just enough for me to say that um, not only uh, Lani was instrumental in making sure that our training programs, our postdoctoral training programs at Jackson were all uh, uh, accredited, um, but he also uh, created new uh, training programs in um, Palm Beach that had never had an allopathic training program before at the JFK Hospital. And very recently, uh, we learned that um, the, uh, the, the training program that we had applied for, uh, uh, for, for emergency medicine was approved, and it's a program that will be centered on the triplet of hospitals, uh, uh, the University of Miami Hospital, Jackson, and Holy Cross. Um, Lani also made sure that we maintain full liaison committee for medical education accreditation, which is important because otherwise we don't have a medical school. And he was instrumental in convincing uh, chairman of the uh, UN board, uh, Stuart Miller to build us a new medical, medical education building, which, by the way, will be also the new home for the Calder Library. And uh, the Calder Library will be omnipresent across that building. So without further ado, I don't think that there is anybody better to discuss the uh, uh, really um, uh, amazing topic of Affordable Care Act and in particular, the implication of the Affordable Care Act for the future of healthcare in the United States and directly linked to that med medical education and, um, and medical knowledge. So um, without further group ado, uh, please um, allow me to um, introduce the Ralph H. and Ruth F. Gross and our lecture speaker, Dr. Lawrence Garner. Well, thank you, Dean Goldschmidt, for a very gracious introduction. Thanks again to the Gross family for making this possible, and special thanks to them for their support for the library in other ways as well, um, an important function. So my challenge is to talk to you about a subject which has made television news with no content, which has been 
poorly described across the aisle in both settings and which detail and substance and any insight has been notably lacking in public discourse. The challenge is to see if anyone is awake at the end of the presentation. Um, we won't have an exit quiz, but I do know some of you, and I might ask what I talked about during this day. So if, if I can have the first slide, I'd like to set the background for the environment at the time of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. We'll look quantitatively, but the growing number of uninsured in this country, the world's wealthiest, was of growing concern to some segments of the population. The progressive increase in health care costs as a percentage of the gross domestic product were of concern to business and economists as well as health policy people and those in the business of delivering health care, not to mention the patients who were trying to pay the premiums. And there was a question as to what we were getting for what we paid for. Was it worthwhile? Was the quality of the product good enough? And there was progressive free-floating dissatisfaction with elements of the care being received by segments of the population. So I don't do this ordinarily, but I'd like to read you a paragraph and then I'll reference where it came from. Well, maybe I'll tell you first. So our new president, Julio Frank, joined by Lincoln Chen, chaired a commission on the education of health professions, which published their report as a Lancet Commission report in 2010. They covered a lot about training, not just physicians, but non-physician providers. But in their executive summary and introduction, that they made the following comments about our health care system. The problems are systemic. Mismatch of competencies to patient and population needs. Poor teamwork, persistent gender stratification of professional status, narrow technical focus without broader contextual understanding, episodic encounters rather than continuous care, predominant hospital orientation at the expense of primary care, quantitative and qualitative imbalances in the professional labor market. I could go on, but it was hardly a complimentary statement about the health care system and echoed the comments, public and private, which created the environment around which the Affordable Care Act was considered and eventually passed. The Institute of Medicine noted that when you looked at the data, errors occurring in inpatient and outpatient settings were accounting for multiple thousands of patient deaths in this country, preventable. And more than one of you, my patients, and all of us, patients, commented about the unfriendliness of the health care system and the seemingly lack of any incentive to involve the patient in his or her care. Next slide, please. Here's the average per capita spending in the United States compared to other countries we would consider sophisticated with sophisticated health care systems. 2006 is the last year here, it was uh, 6,500 uh, or so, but I can tell you that the last numbers published by the same group, which were right around 2013, now show our numbers to be $8,500 per person per year, per capita. Think what that means for a moment. Family of four. $34,000 in uh, 2015 dollars for health care. Think of what a business owner has to spend. Think of what someone who's buying his or her own insurance on the uh, open market who doesn't qualify for a subsidy has to spend. And think about the cost of the subsidies that went into the Affordable Care Act. Don Berwick, who we'll talk, hear from later, thinks this is a disgrace and the dollars being spent on health care are diverting dollars from improvement in education, improvement in access to education, improvement in infrastructure, and a whole series of areas that make our country less competitive compared to others. Next, please. So what do we get for that? Well, in long and short, across the population, not in specific uh, selected segments, not a, not a lot. We finish at the bottom of the uh, life expectancy list here. 
and at the top of the costs spent to achieve that. If we look at issues like infant mortality, preventive issues like vaccination, other population measures of health, we don't score well. Segments of our population access very high quality of care, but across the board, the U.S. population has not too much to be proud of in the health care delivery system, and we're paying a lot to get there. Here's the issue of uninsured. Projected by 2020 by the Levin Group, uh, who, Lewin Group, who are good at this sort of thing, were there no Affordable Care Act passed, the projection would be 61 million uninsured, or more than 20 percent of our population. You can decide for yourself whether or not you believe that characterizes the country in which you would like to live and be proud of. Next. So the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed on March 23, 2010, and probably unlike almost anybody in this room, I remember where I was. <clears throat> I'd been working with a couple of groups who were doing the pre-policy for this in advance, and I saw this as a celebratory moment. It was a small crowd. We didn't have a large celebration, and we weren't waving flags, and I was in a hotel room in Philadelphia. But nonetheless, I watched the votes and uh, I was pleased. The big picture of the Affordable Care Act, you've all heard it, and this I think everyone knows. Increased provisions to make coverage available to virtually every citizen or legal immigrant in the United States. Importantly, the removal of pre-existing condition exclusions or underwriting and the ability to have portability so families could move from city to city, state to state, job to job, no longer being handcuffed because the health insurance kept them in an unenviable and unpleasant circumstance. A remarkable step for those who were suffering from that. Maybe not us in the room, but think about it. It ended up being a multi-payer kind of compromise. There was little or no appetite in the country for a single-payer system. The Medicare for All, which is being uh, proposed by some of the candidates for president, was not a tenable political s solution then, nor was it likely, is it likely to be one now. So we're dealing with multiple insurance companies and governmental entities that pay uh, for the cost of care. And you all should be aware that virtually 50 percent of the health care payments in the United States come from the government, before the Affordable Care Act and now. So for those who didn't want the government involved in health care, veterans, active duty servicemen, Medicare and Medicaid, and a few other unique plans, pays half the health care bill in the U.S. before this all started. What I'm going to talk about today are some of the things that were in the small print. This bill is 997 pages long, and there is no question in my mind that anyone who voted for it never read it. I'm even pretty sure that those who sponsored it had little knowledge of what was in it. And we probably can tell that it was a whole bunch of young kids, like our medical students and uh, MPH students sitting in the audience here, who actually wrote the bill and occasionally gave a little word or two to their senator or congressman because the clever parts of the bill are in the small print. I'm going to talk about the facilitating uh, statements and, and uh, legislation which allows for innovation in payment and financing methodology in healthcare, which enhances patient safety, which deals with this really difficult to understand, not just for doctors, but for everybody, of the volume versus value equation, and which is going to impact, I believe, title of the talk, how the healthcare system eventually rolls out. Next, please. But there were a few things that happened between the cup and the lip. A slight literary reference for those so inclined in the room. <clears throat> the Supreme Court ruled that the Medicare expansion was optional, not mandatory. So about half the states did not expand Medicaid, and the state of Florida being a great example of a state that chose not to do this, leaving 
when I made this slide, 765,000 people uninsured, earning slightly more than a bare necessity wage, which gets you into Florida in the current Medicaid plan, and not enough to qualify for the Affordable Care Act. Many other states are in the same circumstance. A bunch, uh, more than half the states chose not to sponsor state exchanges and went with a default federal exchange, which, as no one in this room is unaware, rolled out really poorly, damaging the credibility of the federal government, of the Affordable Care Act, and of the proponents of those. It's recovered mostly, but it wasn't a good deal at the time. I'm going to leave small business out for you all, but I am going to raise an interesting question. I wonder how many of you are aware of the sub-quality insurance policies that were marketed and sold on television and the newspapers, the ones that didn't cover cancer, for example, or had a maximum benefit of $10,000 if you get ill. Uh, there were a number, especially those sold to episodic employed people like artists and actors, uh, which became non-legal after the Affordable Care Act was passed and created some unhappiness in the world when it was, in our world, when it was discovered that the policies were so bad and that good ones were much more expensive. Those of you who are really expert like Eric and others in the room will remember that Obama actually gave a one year or two year extension to keep these inadequate policies in place, but the insurance companies were so embarrassed as to how bad they were that they stopped writing them in general. That created some unhappiness and was a consequence. And we might mention a little bit about what happened with small networks, and Dr. Howell told me today that, which health care plan, Dr. Howell? United. United Healthcare has decided they're not going to participate in the Affordable Care Act because they've lost money and their premium structure just wouldn't make it work. So there's nothing perfect about this act. We shouldn't walk away thinking that. But there's a lot, I think, which is beneficial. Next slide, please. So at the end of the first year of enrollment, from October to May, uh, during a very difficult time, 8 million people enrolled in exchange uh, uh, sold policies. And the next slide. Those 8 million are identified in the second bar. The first might be some of the young adults in the room uh, who are covered by their, patient, by their parents' insurance policies up to age 26. That was mandated in the Affordable Care Act and at this time included a million extra people. The consumers who re had no subsidy qualification, needed to buy insurance, knew they had to, Five million were added to the insurance rolls during this period of time. Six million increased coverage in Medicaid and CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Plan, which is a Medicaid-like program for children, resulting in the first year increase in coverage of 20 million people. You can decide that significance. Next, please. So from the Commonwealth Fund in 2015, what effectively is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my time. In addition to the health insurance coverages, the Affordable Care Act contains numerous provisions that directly target <coughs> how health care is organized, delivered, and paid for in the United States. These provisions aim at well-known shortcomings. We've heard a lot about shortcomings, and I'll bet you each of you could contribute to that list. Building on existing reform models, the law takes multiple approaches testing new models of health care delivery, shifting from a reimbursement system based on how much you do to how valuable it is, and investing in resources to develop system-wide improvement. Think about the super tanker called health care delivery system rolling along with all of its component parts, many of which are represented in this room, and think about what it takes to change course. Next, please. So, it's reasonably clear to most of us in here, probably, that regulation about quality and improving outcomes and decreasing length of stay is virtually impossible. Regulation doesn't change behavior in these settings. The 
the health care providers are too smart. You can write a regulation and the next day the 17 law firms working for the group practice and your hospital have written the exception. So regulations didn't work to change behavior. And education really doesn't, I hate to say this as an education person, but education as a rule doesn't change behavior permanently, but incentives do. So I would propose to you that the genius of the Affordable Care Act lies in the utility implementation of financial and peer esteem incentives to not only encourage change, but make it worthwhile. And the hat trick is, at the same time, to improve patient outcomes, to improve patient perception of the system, and to make money. Next slide. I decided this was unreadable, so we're just going to go to the next one. <laughs> Every once in a while you have to do that. So some of the tools that were used, and then we'll talk about what they mean. Bundled payments for the experts in the audience. Value-based proposition. The Medicare sh Shared Saving Initiative, which I'll refer to. The Independent Payment Advisory Board. Anyone know what happened to that? Congress didn't fund it, so it actually doesn't exist. There's no, this was a board meant to, independent of Congress, note that if the Medicare costs go up, that there would be increases in a variety of payments. The Congress decided they couldn't allow anything independent of it, their own wisdom and didn't fund this entity. But the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, just beginning to publish data on, can you believe this? Should we pay for treatments that don't work? Should we? Well, in the US, we do, with a remarkable proportion, billions of dollars. This uh, institute and entity is beginning to look at the question of which ones don't work, and should that finally and eventually affect payment and reimbursement? And demonstration projects. Next slide, please. So actually, this could be the whole talk. Here it is. I would like each of you for a moment to study this slide. You don't have to fill out a piece of paper, I promise. Which health care system do you interact with? And don't speak out loud and make the dean and me feel terrible about this, right? We're part of one. Uh, but which one do you interact with? So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. This one is the patient seeing the primary care physician the wise physician saying, you need to see an ologist. Here's a list. Or check who's on your health plan. Their phone numbers are at the bottom. This is the specialist uh, with whom this patient either struggles or not to get an appointment. Arriving, he or she wondered if the medical record from the primary care physician's office arrived. How often do we think that happens? and then wondering whether or not the specialist would actually call the primary care physician or vice versa and discuss the continued care. If a hospital is needed, you need to find one or at least see if your insurance pays for it. If the pharmacy, we have a pharmacy here, we deal with the pharmacy independently. This is outpatient durable goods. This is the tertiary care in the community hospital. So the care and the arrangement of care is the responsibility of the family, and I would think most of us have had a less than optimal experience. So I'd like you to look at this one, which I think is where our institution, U Health, many others aim to go, and where some organizations currently have achieved this level of integration of health care. The primary care and physician and specialist share their own, electric, uh, their own electronic health record. They actually talk with each other. There's no real fee that the primary care physician gets for the visit, nor the specialist. They're all paid by the system to render care. We'll talk about that in a second. The hospitals are either owned by or contracted by the same health system. Same with pharmacy, same with durable goods. It's a relatively seamless system with appointments made for the patient by the system, electronic health record and information shared, redundancy eliminated, 
and a sense of priority for the patient. These are the in-between models. Next slide. This isn't as hard as it looks. I know that we have some in the room who at the sight of what might be a graph <coughs> develop palpitations and could under some circumstances be actually referred for an electrocardiogram, but we'll roll right through this. Down here is fee for service. The intent of this uh, graph is to show it fits best with independent practices and hospitals and it gets progressively harder to integrate uh, health care delivery, even primary care group practice, if you only get paid for when you see the patient. There's actually no money to invest in integration and to change the incentives. So the fee-for-service system works best at this corner of the graph. And if we get up here to care coordination and then finally how well do you do caring for the patient and how well does the patient, which includes every one of us in this room, feel and do in this healthcare system, it looks like a different payment system. The global payment per enrollee system makes the most sense. Now we're going to see migration from here to here as a very stepwise progression, slower in some places, faster in others. As you might guess on the left coast, uh, integration with global management fees in systems such as Kaiser Permanente uh, are well along. In Pennsylvania, uh, the Geisinger Health System has uh, grown and is another example of an integrated delivery system, which we'll call something else in one minute. And I just would ask you to think about Leon Medical Centers down here in South Florida in Miami as an organization which has received five stars from Medicare in its integration and outcomes and keeps their patients because they're happy. Next slide, please. So I'm talking about accountable care organizations. These are the organizations that take the entire premium dollar. Well, what's the health care premium? Well, it's not, it's not uh, uh, $8,500 per person, but it's not far from that. And if you're a Medicare patient, the Medicare Advantage payment this year to those organizations is about $14,000 per payment. And in California, it's competitive. Takes the entire health care payment for one year, puts it in a great big sack of money, and then decides how many primary care physicians, how many specialists, how many left eye specialists, and how many hospital beds will really be required to take care of this number of patients. Incentivizes patient satisfaction and outcomes, and if the patients stay healthier, not such a bad outcome, need less hospitalization as opposed to outpatient visits, less ER call as opposed to an outpatient visit, they save money and make money. If the patients aren't well cared for, if a population of patients become sick because of lack of care, then these models don't work. Next slide. So can you change behavior by altering payment? Next slide. Well, you can. These are the two-year results of the Medicare Shared Savings program affordable care organizations and suffice it to say without trying to read this that timely care that means not much waiting a hundred percent we have any independent health systems that achieve those numbers uh, communication between doctors 93 percent at the high bar uh, Reconciliation of medications, that's a really good one. You leave the hospital on seven medicines, you came in on four, no one actually knows what happened, and it's not documented anywhere. That's a cause for readmission to the hospital. Next slide. What's happened to hospital readmission rate when you've been incentivized with a global uh, payment fee? In this population, over a year, over three years, the rate's fallen about 1.5%. Next. I like this one, hospital-acquired conditions. That's a great euphemism, isn't it, for bad things that happen to you because we take care of you. Not well. 
So adverse drug reactions fell by 19%. Catheter-associated bloodstream infections. Doctors have lots of words for those infections, sepsis, this, that, and the other thing. But if you can prevent 50% of it by letting the hospitals and the physicians decide how they want to spend the money and maybe hire that one extra infectious disease coordinator nurse, sounds like it'd be a worthwhile preposition, proposition, and it is, and the rest. So incentives can change medical behaviors for the better for patients. And by the way, if you eliminate these, you spend less money on health care in the hospital as well. Next slide. So in uh, January of 2015, Sylvia Burwell, a name known to some, she's our Secretary of Health and Human Services, published an article in, the, in one of our prestigious uh, medical journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, and gave the future picture for the strategy of Medicare. There will be more incentives to motivate high-value care, and by 2018, 50% of the payment models would not be fee-for-service in Medicare. 30% are not now, and, and includes our old friend, the ACOs, and other methodologies. There would be rewards for teamwork, integration, and caring for populations of patients. And this is a tough one for all of us, especially those of us on the front line, dealing with electronic health records, trying to make it a benefit to patient care and not an aggravation for physicians. Next slide. So value. When I first heard about value, I said, what are they doing to me? I'm a doctor. I'm, not, I'm worried about good care. And I don't want to hear about this value because I thought there was a cost piece in this. And there is. This is an issue, can you improve care and save money at the same time? Well, if you start by the elimination of unnecessary or redundant care, you can save a lot of money. We'll look at that in a minute. If you implement incentives to allow hospitals to improve the way they function, if you shift care from an expensive setting, the hospital, to a less expensive setting, the outpatient physician's office. Now, I haven't met very many patients who'd rather be in the hospital than being seen in the office. So it doesn't sound to me like that value proposition is going to make anybody unhappy, except maybe the stockholders. And in North Carolina, the decreased use of emergency room and hospital saved a great deal of money. We'll talk about chronic disease management in a minute. Next slide. So the Congressional Budget Office, considered to be a dispassionate uh, nonpartisan entity, has suggested that 30% of the health care costs, now health care costs in the U.S. are in round numbers, about 2.2 trillion in 20, uh, 2008, approaching 2.7 trillion this year, we're talking about saving $900 billion because the results of the CAT scan that you had last month couldn't be found. Or, even more frequent, the CAT scan wasn't very good and the surgeon you're seeing today says, I can't operate on the basis of this. It was done at this crummy place. We'll have to get another one. So maybe he's right, it was crummy, but it should never have been done there in the first place, right? 30%, $800 billion, uh, most people don't disagree with that estimate. So how do you do this? Well, you start to look at patient-centered outcome research and look at unproven tests and procedures. You collect the information in electronic health records to avoid redundant testing. You pay the cardiologist or the radiologist to be there and think about the patients, and he or she doesn't have to do another test to take the same paycheck home. So can you actually save money if you don't do extra tests? You can. Now, I had lunch with a radiologist a couple of weeks ago in a medical meeting in Baltimore, and he said to me, how are we going to do this? And I said, hire less people. You don't need 12 radiologists. Maybe you only need eight busy ones doing the right stuff. 
How do you change the training and workforce issues? You make the jobs less available in areas where they're redundant. We'll talk about bundling, bundled pricing maybe next. We now care for, as opposed to when I trained, there are some students in the room here who graduated from the same college that I did. And one of them suggested that we had the same biochemistry teacher. And I said, sounds rather unlikely to me. But they said, well, he was a friend of Watson and Crick. I said, OK, maybe. Still there teaching. But, but when I was a junior physician, we admitted folks with pneumonia and diabetes and blood clots in the leg. And we don't do that anymore unless the patient is unstable and at risk. We can treat these illnesses in the outpatient setting and no one's unhappy about that. How about your doctor telling you to go to the emergency room and get a cardiogram because your heart feels irregular? What has he consigned you to do? 12 hours in the place, a fourteen or $15,000 health insurance bill, maybe a cardiogram at the end of the day, and only 50-50 that he'll get the result. Instead of keeping an office open, maybe staffing it with an advanced nurse practitioner, knowing you could get a cardiogram, blood test, and the like, up to and including 4 a.m. in the morning, it clearly, there clearly are better, better models to deal with acute care. And the California story I mentioned to you, they invested a billion dollars in the primary care medical home. They saved almost $894 million over four years by shifting care from the ER to outpatient settings. So these things with asterisks and names are all published. And work on preventing hospital admissions for illnesses that are amenable to treatment in outpatient settings. Everyone, everybody wins, but not if it's fee for service. If the patient calls you and you tell her to increase the asthma medicine or to take more fluid pills and that results in no, uh, no hospitalization, who benefits first? The patient. Does the doctor benefit financially? Not in our current system. He doesn't get paid. So the incentives to develop systems to do this have not existed until changes in these payment models have been implemented. Next slide. So here's the bundled payment strategy. What is it? Well, I'll show you a real life example, but this is $20,000 for a heart operation. You pay everybody, hospital X, pay the surgeon, the cardiologist, all those EKGs, you can do one or 40. You don't get any more money. And you can keep the patient for a week or three weeks. You don't get any more money. And if the patient's readmitted to the hospital, we won't pay you. Now you average 17,000 per admission, but we're going to give you 20, but we won't pay for a second one or any complications. Can they change and reform, reform the system to do that? And the answer is yes. It's not so easy. But those kind of incentives are the ones that physicians and healthcare providers have responded to. Okay, next slide. Chronic disease management, much harder, but avoiding hospitalization, doing what the patient wants, takes a lot of us a long time, and I include myself, to learn how to do that. Maybe it's not the evidence-based approach, but maybe the patient wants about half the evidence-based approach. And then the really big challenge, the prevention of predisposing conditions. So the use of fast food is inversely related to income in the United States. So the issue of income inequity is closely tied, as all our public health people will say, the social determinants of health care to obesity and diabetes. So these are easy to put on a slide and hard to do. But as you begin to do them, and some of our neighbors, uh, north, Canada, across the water, England, have begun programs aimed at dealing with these very difficult issues. You don't solve them in a week or a year, but you can begin to solve them. Illnesses which predispose to more serious illnesses leading to hospitalization, cardiac disease, kidney failure, and the like. Next. 
A couple of examples. So no one would consider Walmart a politically progressive organization, right? I mean, it wouldn't be classified on the far left of the thinking, but Walmart took a look at what they were spending for spinal and cardiac surgery with a take your choice and pick any hospital system and said, we're going to make a better deal. So they put out an RFP to these six high class quality places and said, bid for the business for all of our patients. And even if the bids came in a little higher than they were paying Community Hospital A or Tertiary Hospital C, they went with this and said to every patient, if you get your cardiac or spinal surgery here, we'll pay for the whole deal and a caretaker and the airfare and the lodging and the meals, period. You won't have any out-of-pocket costs. Now, Walmart did not do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They did this because these organizations figured out how to deliver a value-based product. No readmissions. The excess utilization was their problem, and they made it work. Was it just Walmart? Next slide. And next. No. General Electric too. They chose knee and hip replacements. Four places, only one a university medical center, I guess one and a half, and said, get your health care here, we'll pay all the costs, don't get it in town, don't get it at your local medical center. Uh, and this equation worked with a bundled payment, a single payment to the entity to pay for everything. Next slide. So I think, as the beginning, this is when the pilot says we're beginning our initial descent, right? <laughs> we'll talk about the metaphor later. Right. As uh, we're seeing some incentives that look like the gradual elimination of the fee-for-service payment system. We're looking at some entities which say your total compensation is not going to be volume-based. There's a minimum productivity required if you're a doctor employed in a system A, B, or C, but we're going to look at patient outcomes, who's not readmitted, who doesn't get a catheter-based infection. You can bet the people whose patients continue to get a catheter-based infection are either being phased out of the healthcare system that is measuring those numbers, we never measured them before, or being encouraged to take more education. Probably we're going to see more global annual fee for patient management under modified payment systems. The incentives already exist to shift care from inpatient to outpatient. One wouldn't immediately invest in building new hospital beds, looking at what's going on in our health care system. There are incentives to shorten stay, incentives to eliminate unnecessary care, and incentives to part encourage patients to part participate in care. Next slide. So Don Berwick was appointed by President Obama to be the director of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. He's a pediatrician, Boston, head of the Institute for Health Improvement. He wasn't confirmed by the Senate, so quit, had to uh, step down after two years. Just before he was made secretary, he issued an RFP for his right knee, a request for proposal. He knew it was going to have to be fixed, so he wanted every hospital in the country to bid on his right knee in the business, and he said he had five requirements. Now, anybody who doesn't want any of these requirements, see me later. I have a special place to send you for health care. <laughs> uh, he wanted no medical errors. Hard to argue with. Uh, he wanted to be helped and not hurt. He didn't want any needless pain. He didn't want the nurse waiting every four hours for the pain medicine, but to ask him if he wanted it now. <clears throat> Don't make me feel helpless. Involve me in the care. If you make an appointment for 9 o'clock, keep it at 9 o'clock and don't waste resources. Now, why did he say that? Why would you care if they throw away 10 
uh, knee uh, braces until they find the one that you like. Next slide. Well, here's what he said. Waste is a symptom of defective process. I want my knee to be in the hands of people who are intolerant of disorder, duplication, and unpredictability and inattention that lie at the root of waste because then I can predict with more confidence that my care will be orderly, coordinated, anticipatory, and attentive. Why don't we insist on that? We should. Okay, so how has the Affordable Care Act gone over in this country? Well, I wouldn't say it was a rousing endorsement. About half the country thinks it's okay, and about half thinks it's the latest disaster to emanate from an overreaching federal government. Who thinks it's okay? Well, the folks who weren't insured and the people who couldn't move because they couldn't get insurance because they'd had a previous condition. Who thinks it's neutral? Those who weren't affected. And the people who are negative, a minority of U.S. physicians who tend to be older, surgical, and who went into medicine for reasons in addition to caring for patients. <laughs> who wanted to build practices, generate revenue, do business and medicine at the same time. I don't think there's any question that what we're seeing is a different population of medical students entering medical school, and I don't think that's bad. Now, I, I happen to believe in all candor that the folks who work at medical centers, like my colleagues here, have already agreed on the equation that they're not going to go out and build a million dollar business. And they are going to accept salary and a bunch of other things which are built into the reform system. But some of our practitioners will probably not be entering medicine, but going to the all <coughs> consuming Wall Street instead to exercise their entrepreneurial skills. It's still a 50-50 proposition. This is a complicated issue. Next slide. I've talked about this. Next slide. And next slide. So I do want to talk to you for a minute about teams. You're going to hear about, health, uh, about teams practicing medicine. Oh my God, did I lose my doctor? No. No, you got your doctor for what we trained him or her to do, which is not necessary always taking the weight, measuring the blood pressure, or uh, the temperature, or necessarily checking the blood sugar with a finger stick. So instead of that, how about the doctor with teams in the office with a well-trained nurse practitioner or a nurse or a social worker? Or if you come from an area of town where you've never seen a doctor before, how about a community health worker, someone in your world who can talk to you a little bit about the steps of getting into the health care system? I mean, I can envision encounters where we have a patient from one of our most underserved areas talking to one of our really super subspecialists, and neither of them understand what the other is saying. And after an hour and a half, no health care has been delivered and a bill has been generated. The doctor isn't particularly happy, and the patient doesn't like it at all. So what about a community health worker and a social worker to kind of introduce the patient to the health care system, see if we can get a sense of what's needed, and then figure out how to deliver it? That'll work if there's a single global management fee. That won't work if it's fee for service. Next slide. And next. So. Let me end by the crystal ball. I'll start with physicians first because they're not the most important entity. I think we're likely to more and more work in small and large groups and less likely to work as independent practices. We're more likely to be employed and generalists before specialists. We're much more likely to work in teams. Different teams for different population of patients. What a great way to begin to deliver care that makes sense. And inpatient teams where if you've got a neurological disorder, you not only get a neurologist, but a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, and maybe somebody to see if your home is safe for you to be go home. Evidence accruing that this works. And we're likely to be paid more on how well the patients do and how few complications they have than how many patients we treat. Next slide. 
And for all of us who are patients, I envision and hope that we will see more and more coordinated care incentivized by how our providers are paid. That we'll see care provided by a mixed model of provider. If you call at 4 a.m. in the morning and you have a cold, if you can talk to somebody and he or she says, Tylenol, lots of fluids and chicken soup, there are data to support chicken soup, you got about 80% of what you needed and if that's a nursing assistant who we trained to do that, you saved a ton of money. You'd like to talk to anybody at 4 o'clock in the morning, so if you can't get a doctor, you talk to somebody's sister's friend and they recommend a Z-Pack which will result in C. difficile colitis, the highest incidence in this country because of the misuse of antibiotics, instead of kind of a rational approach in your practice. So I think we're going to see mixed models of providers providing care. Now let me address this issue of variation in physician quality. Let me quote you a fact. Women with ovarian cancer live at least one year longer if they see a gynecologist oncologist than a gynecologist. How can we afford to keep that differential in place? Why don't we have a system where everybody gets to see the gynecologist and those with ovarian cancer see the GYN oncologist? So everybody benefits from the extra year of life. If we can do that, we can decrease the variation in the quality of care and the fact that you can't see every doctor you wanted to on the list may be less important if you know you're getting better care and less inferior quality. Obvious, these are all important, not incentivized now, and priority, patients and families. And finally, for that individual patient who says, I would like another MRI doctor, and the doctor says, you know, it's not really indicated. The patient said, I'd really like to have it, and the doctor says, our plan lets you have it. You pay 70%, we'll pay 30%. Hey, we should do that. We have a lot of excess care, some of it demanded by patients. I think but then patients should pay. It's not a straightforward system, but there's a way to go. So at the end of the day, let me suggest that the Affordable Care Act has built in it not just insurance issues and not just insurability issues, but a whole lot of changes in the health care system, which I hope you will see evolve over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer questions. Dr. Kober must have a question. <laughs> no. Yes. Uh, they're in the same category. Same category. I, I, I can't envision the fun of creating different teams for different populations of patients. I have patients from Coral Gables who need to spend all the time with a doctor. Maybe they'll pay for that, but I have patients from other parts of this city and town who haven't yet been, begun to be able to communicate effectively. So physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, nursing assistants, social workers, community health workers, and secretaries, which at the University of Miami we call executive assistants, can all be part of the health care team. Why do I have to order a mammogram on a woman over age 55 who needs one? That shouldn't take a microsecond. Right now we require the physician to order the mammogram. Come on, Dr. Warren. Do you think that the out of network cost problem that we're seeing now can be dealt with short of requiring legislation at the congressional level, or are there other ways, effective ways to deal with the problem? So you're now, so he suddenly got in the weeds. I mean, I hope you heard the question here. So you sign up for a health plan, Silver B sub 1 through 4. And you need an ophthalmologist, and they have three, but they're all in Key Largo, and their waiting list is a month. And you decide to go see the Baskin Palmer ophthalmologist, who's not in the network, and you get a nice modest bill of $1,900 for a short visit. <clears throat> There's a lot of, there are a lot of issues here in how you do this. Uh, I don't have an easy solution. I don't like congressional legislation because they're responding to what they perceive as the needs of the people who will keep them in office 
and continue their ineffective existence. So I'm not terribly. <laughs> Sir. What strategic question in the United States does that not apply to? <laughs> Just pick one. <laughs> yeah, so our, our, med our university, so, so President Shalala, when she was president, I haven't met the new president personally, but she used to walk by our office uh, the group talking about the medical practice with a big hypothetical bag of money and she would say here's 100 million dollars I'm dropping it on the table you guys can have it at the medical school you take care of everybody and if you spend less than 100 million you get to keep it but if you spend a nickel more don't come to see me and we were terrified to take the risk to do that because we don't have the systems in place to manage it and she would do that every couple of years, especially to me, to just annoy me when I gave a talk like this. So that's details. Dr. Thur. Uh, you didn't mention too much about the role of insurance companies. Oh, look, they, you know, insurance and the pharmaceutical companies were the price of passing the bill. And what cost So here's the cost. You know what the cost is. You know, you're going to get me in trouble. So we know what the, uh, in the small print, that slide I eliminated. So the Affordable Care Act says that, depending on the population, either 80 or 85 percent of the total premium dollar has to be spent on health care. What it doesn't say is that the other 20 to 15 percent is used by the insurance company as administrative cost and profit. The administrative cost for Medicare is about 4 percent. So you can decide what happens with 2.7 trillion dollars, 20 percent is 540 billion, 4 percent of that is about a quarter, round numbers, 140, so there's about 450 billion dollars left that the insurance companies are taking. We passed the bill with a compromise, we, I didn't pass the bill, with a compromise to the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies to get it done and sooner or later, there'll have to be some courage to fix it. Sir. Um, let me first say. So I'm always worried when somebody writes down and starts saying, let me first say, <laughs> OK. Primarily three great things. Uh, first, I think the US healthcare system, healthcare, is the best in the world, by far. And thanks to everyone in this room. So you're, so you're not going to have me argue. I would only add the following sentence, depending upon who you are. And if you can access it. No, no, we do not have the best health care. Our no, outcomes are okay, but we don't. I mean, I hear this from Congress all the time, and it's just not true. I defer to my public health colleagues. <laughs> Same. So tell me your question. <laughs> okay, so your question. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. We. Well, let's talk. So I, I won't, I have to comment on one comment of yours. Selected audiences and populations of patients in this country receive excellent health care in defined circumstances. I don't believe they, we receive, even you all, 
receive the kind of preventive and continuous health care that, uh, that the absolute best system can do. And I don't think this country has a first-class health system, if you consider the population. We could talk about this forever. Kaiser is its own insurance company. They're, they're actually a great model, right? They, they compete, though. They compete with Blue Cross Blue Shield in California and a couple of others, and they sometimes get beat because they don't turn virtually anybody away. And you can't underwrite anymore and charge premium based on illness. So Kaiser, in particular, my daughter-in-law, in truth and uh, lending here, is a pediatrician with Group Health in Seattle, which is another ACO. She's a primary care pediatrician, paid a very competitive salary, and she gets bonuses because of patient satisfaction. Why are they paying her so much? Because they decided if they invest in primary care, they don't have to have any hospitalization for kids or less. They looked at the value equation. I don't think we're getting too big. I don't think we're going to have a single payer. I think they're going to be choices. I think the West Coast is going to be early in innovation before the East Coast. And I think we have a long way to go to make the health care system good. I'm in all in favor of competition, but under the circumstances where we demand quality and outcome. Albert. I mean, what percent of the cost in healthcare is related to physicians as compared to hospitals and insurers? So I, How much physicians play a role yeah. in this high cost? So the last time I looked at this, and I, you know, you're asking me, it's a, it's a distinct minority. Physician fees are the 20 percent, 18 percent of the healthcare care dollars. Um, hospitals are most pharmaceuticals next and then a bunch of other things. We didn't get into this issue of how our physician compensation in this country compares to the other countries on that list using a bunch of normalized issues. We're very well compensated in this country for health care. We probably deserve to deliver a better product considering how well we're paid. Just an observation. Yes. Yeah, look at OCED website for the latest, but that's where all this came from. It's an international organization. Um, so what have all those other countries been doing that we have Oh, well, you know, come on. Yeah, you. Think about every physician in the bottom part of my slide. So the National Health Service Corps in National Health Service in England has a million things wrong with it, but maybe a million and a half right. And if you don't want to wait for your knee in either England or Canada, you can buy up for the same doctor in the afternoon for the surgery at a private hospital. Philosophically, I don't have a necessarily problem with that as long as the minimum delivered level of care is of high quality. So what they do is they have a budget. They spend within their budget. They don't have just a global fee per patient. They have a country fee for patient. Canada has a province fee for patient. They decide how much they're going to spend. We don't. That's probably good for a lot of us. And you know, I wouldn't tell you that I'd be all in favor of being a salaried physician in England. But there may be a middle ground. France, the same. Canada, the same. And they've got a pretty, they're a different system. They have health care fee for service. But when the money runs out, you don't get any more money in the province from the health service system. There's lots of stuff to learn around the world, and we can teach them, too. I think incentivizing behavior change is a huge lesson here. The UK is starting to do it. Some other places are, and that's what works in this country. So I'm not, in, uh, I'm not against competition uh, and incentivization and people getting paid. Last question. No, I didn't. Yeah, that wasn't on the slide. I said that. It's true. Yeah. Yes, with ACA subsidies. Yep. So, given given that if we were as efficient as Australia, our care would be covered completely by the government with what we're paying now, and no one would have to pay anything out of pocket. Right, but they wouldn't sell as many luxury cars in downtown Miami to physicians, and there's a whole economy. We built our whole economy on on a more aggressive payment methodology. So I can't argue with you. You're in the Bernie Sanders camp. I kind of, no, no, I'm only kidding. But, but there are big issues here about physician compensation. I didn't even address it. I figured it's dangerous enough to give this talk. 
Thank you.